Okay, so well, thanks very much for uh, having me here. I, I, I think it's the first time I've been to Nottingham. Uh, I may have, may have forgotten some <laughs> some trip. But anyway, there you go. Uh, so it's a pleasure to see your beautiful campus. And so what I want to talk about today is gravity in twister space. So I want to talk about some work that, um, in fact, I'll, I'll primarily be talking, uh, well, aiming towards the work I uh, work done last year with uh, Tim Adamo, who who. Um, uh, has just finished in Oxford and has now gone on to a postdoc in Cambridge uh, working with David Skinner. Um, I'll touch on a few other ideas. Um, Twister theory has been evolving for um, uh, well over 40 years, 45 years, and it's not, uh, I, I, I can sort of probably guarantee that nobody in this room has really spent much time with Twisters. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, so, so it'll be a bit of a lightning tour. Um, and also the other feature of this talk is that I'm going to be focus mostly on scattering amplitudes. And again, I think not many people in this audience uh, do amplitudes. So I have to do a lightning tour of that as well. But um, the main focus of this talk, though, is, is, is how to express um, uh, uh, gravity in twister space. And, and this is uh, an objective that's been going back um, some 45 years since Roger Penrose first proposed that um, uh, gravity should be um, quant quantized most naturally in twister space. And um, I'm not going to introduce twister space till a bit later, but uh, twister space is an auxiliary space to space time from which space time events can be reconstructed and the manifold, space time manifold can be reconstructed. And his idea was that twister space should provide the correct vehicle. Uh, um, uh, now, of course, we had um, a, a lot of struggles expressing full gravity in twister space over the years. I, I, I would say it's still not completely understood how to do it properly. So, and, and this talk would be more um, associated with recent developments. Um, twister theory itself actually had, uh, I was unable to really engage with physics at all properly, except for the self-dual sectors of various theories, uh, until 2003, uh, when Witten uh, had the hit upon the idea of putting a string theory into twister space. And, um, and that led to a whole load of applications of twister theory to uh, gauge theory scattering amplitudes. And I'm not going to uh, review those here, um, uh, but um, uh, the, the story I'm telling today really is a spin-off from that um, because string theories always have a gravity component as well as a, a gauge part. And, um, and in fact, very early on, uh, I was able to show that um, Witten's original twisted string theory uh, uh, could be at least partially understood via a, 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 an action in twister space for conformal gravity. And um, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's been a struggle since to actually sort of make that, make, make some statement about Einstein gravity in twister space. Um, and so uh, a bit later, um, I, I managed to get a twister action with, with Martin Wolf, a twister action for the self dual Einstein equations. And then with David Skinner, um, uh, uh, we, we used these ideas to generate a proof uh, that uh, hadn't hitherto been constructed of um, uh, one of the key scattering amplitudes in gravity, the so-called MHV amplitude. It's the simplest gravity beyond, amplitude beyond the self dual sector. But uh, uh, last year, there have been a, a lot of de developments, uh, or a year and a half, um, maybe two years, I guess this uh, first paper was two years ago. Um, so, so, so we've learned how to get uh, uh, some Einstein amplitudes out of the original Witten or Berkowitz Witten twister string. Um, we've got better formulae for MHV amplitudes than David and I managed to get back in 2008. And then these led to a, 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 a complete breakthrough in understanding how to understand the full classical tree-level S matrix in twister space. So this is... Um, a formula due to Freddy Cachazzo and David Skinner, which we proved together uh, um, uh, about a year and a half ago. The, um, uh, uh, David Skinner has um, sort of managed to understand this formula as a, uh, arising from a, a string theory in twister space. This is, this is really a formula for n equals 8 supergravity, although being tree level, you can peel off the various bits. And um, uh, uh, in this talk, I'm going to be focusing more on work uh, that I did with Tim Adamo, which was to um, uh, uh, try to use these ideas to uh, uh, head off towards a, a twister action for Einstein gravity. And um, 
uh, and to understand what happens when the cosmological constant is non-zero for this MHV amplitude. And uh, so, 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 anyway, a lot of progress in the last 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 two years. Um, so, um, I'm assuming people here are not so hot on scattering amplitudes. So, I want to sort of present this in a way that may be friendly, a bit more friendly for sort of people who are used to relativity. Uh, so, 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 I'm assuming that people know about null infinity. You, you, you imagine that so this is a, a past infinity, scry minus, and, and scry plus is future infinity. And uh, you can imagine uh, when you're calculating uh, an S matrix, this, all this talk is going to be about the classical S matrix. It's really be about classical gravity. So, there's no uh, one loop effects here. So, uh, you can imagine that you're posing. Uh, asymptotic data uh, at um, past infinity, you then imagine that you solve for the metric on M, and then you, um, uh, well, what you're interested in, of course, is the output at scribe plus, at future infinity, but the, um, uh, you can write down a generating function that gets you from scry minus to scribe plus by evaluating the action on the metric that, that, that uh, you get by evolving in from scry minus. And uh, so the actual computation that you want to do then, uh, if you're working perturbatively, is to, is to pose the initial data on scry minus as a sum of um, uh, uh, modes. These usually would be momentum eigenstates, these GIs, and you have some small parameter epsilon. And uh, with that data, you can solve for the metric on space-time. Uh, you evolve it all the way through, and then you evaluate the um, action on that data and, uh, uh, and then you expand it to first order in each of these epsilons. So, so this actually gives you an nth order expansion of gravity about flat space. Uh, so, so, so this is so the n particle amplitude is the n, nth order perturbation about flat space. So the um, uh, 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 th this is the th object that we're going to be com computing in the following, and the g's. Uh, are most likely going to be momentum eigenstates if you, in any explicit formulae uh, that, that, that we see following. Similarly, uh, I, I'm going to be concerned about the relationship between Einstein gravity and so-called conformal gravity. Conformal gravity is the theory that's conformally invariant that has the action uh, of the Weyl tensor squared. And uh, uh, so similarly, if you want to do the corresponding calculation for conformal gravity, you're going to be evaluating the action on the evolved metric from the data at scry minus, so, so that data at scry minus, you evolve it uh, using the equations of conformal gravity now, and um, uh, uh, you get pull out the coefficients of uh, all the epsilons to get the tree-level S matrix element for that. So that's, so that, that's the object that one's trying to calculate. Um, and if you, uh, that there's a nice relationship between conformal gravity and Einstein gravity, which um, uh, uh, was pointed out by Maldacena uh, after an argument due to Michael Anderson. Um, and, and it uses the fact that the Einstein equations imply the conformal gravity equations. But this isn't quite enough because I was saying that the um, amplitude that you compute uh, is actually related to the action evaluated on the data that's been evolved. And so um, uh, uh, the, the relationship they get is, is that the gravitational Einstein gravitational amplitude is related to 1 over lambda times the um, uh, conformal gravity amplitude. And in particular, you can see that this is a singular relationship uh, as lambda tends towards zero. Um, and so, so, so the idea here then is that you evaluate the conformal gravity action on Einstein data, but you have to divide by a 1 over lambda. So uh, the, the idea of this proof is, is, is that... Um, the uh, uh, conformal gravity action can, can be written uh, on shell where the field equations are satisfied, but it's a vial tensor squared can be rewritten as the Euler class plus, uh, or some number times the Euler class, plus lambda squared times the volume. You know, the Ricci tensor itself is, uh, is, is assumed to be vanishing, or well, the trace V Ricci tensor is assumed to be vanishing. Uh, and, and so the Einstein action is essentially just lambda times the volume. And so there's just a, this ratio, ratio of lambda discrepancy between the two calculations because the topological um, term will be trivial in scattering theory, in perturbation theory. Um, this is 
short-circuiting the meat of the argument, which is actually in checking that the boundary terms all work out. And that's actually quite a complicated thing to do and, and was really the, uh, what made this a very non-trivial result of Michael Anderson's you know, the, the, involving this holographic renormalization. Um, sorry, because uh, I, I guess we're, we're working uh, in this kind of non-compact context. Well, well I've, I've, I've written this here as if we were working on um, uh, 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 some perturbation of flat space with zero cosmological constant, whereas, in fact, to make this exact argument work, lambda has to be non-zero. And, and so you have to work with, um, uh, say, a de Sisser-like infinity to uh, uh, set up an evolution problem. And the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the actions all need to be, well, the, 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 the uh, conformal gravity action is perfectly re regular as, uh, as you go out to infinity, but the Einstein action needs boundary terms, and uh, th there's a standard prescription for those boundary terms. Uh, I suppose it goes back to Gibbons and Hawking, but then there's, uh, uh, that, that was um, in a zero cosmological constant context, and so that's been extended to uh, uh, ADS. Okay, so, so then you, you, you plug in your Fourier modes, um, and uh, these all have um, uh, uh, zero momentum, and uh, so, so, so you actually end up with uh, an amplitude, which is really just a function of n momenta, and um, uh, uh, in four dimensions, I, mean, I hope people are happy with spinners, a null momenta factorizes into a product of a primed and an unprimed spinner. If you're a particle physics, it's... Uh, Particle physics, it's dotted and undotted, and these are alphas. Uh, if you, in the Penrose school, these uppercase indices are best, and so on. Anyway, um, uh, it's also very convenient to use supersymmetry because um, uh, uh, you, you can uh, um, get generating functions for amplitudes that involve, involve all spins and all helicities. Um, and, and so I will be using some supersymmetry later. This is, uh, of course, optional at tree level. Um, and so anyway, you often have a, a super momentum which has some fermionic variables. But I, I'm going to suppress all of that kind of technical detail because I've got to get through a lot of material and uh, uh, just ask that you not be too phased by it. So anyway, you, you think you have a, 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 a function of n momenta, and um, you need to know about the polarization information, and, and that's... Um, included in the phase of these spinners. The, the phase isn't determined because the momentum only gives you the product. Uh, but you need to know whether it's um, positive or negative helicity. Uh, and in fact, uh, what you discover is that um, the number of, uh, 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 we, that there's some simplicity if, if, if there's a very small number of, uh, pos of, of, of uh, negative helicity particles. In particular, the tree level amplitude vanishes, or any supersymmetric amplitude vanishes uh, uh, when it's thus zero or one negative helicity particles by virtue of supersymmetry. In the context of the classical theory, you, you can understand um, uh, the, the k equals zero version vanishing because the positive and negative helicity uh, fields are, are dual to each other. And, uh, uh, and so uh, uh, this would be the, for, for k equals um, Zero. This would be the, the the probability of creating an anti-self dual um, mode from purely self dual modes coming in, and that's zero because the self dual sector is 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 is, is um, uh, consistent. And uh, with one negative helicity particle, uh, uh, that's actually that would actually detect scattering in the self dual sector, and um, because the self dual sector of gravity is um, integrable, there, uh, there, there, there's no scattering in the self dual sector, at least not, uh, uh, not at tree level, not, 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 in, not, not perturbing around flat space. So um, the first non-trivial amplitude is the case where there's two negative helicity particles, and this has become known as the MHV amplitude. And, and this would be the focus of much of what I'm saying, although I'll show you formally for all helicity, or all MHV degrees. So all, all values of k uh, uh, are now known. Um, and, and so you can think of this as, as being the, the positive helicity that a negative helicity particle picks up when it's propagating uh, on a self-dual background. So you, th th this, this can be understand in some sense, understood as a first-order perturbation away from the self-dual sector. 
And, and in general, um, that, that the uh, arbitrary MHV degrees count the order of expansion around the self-dual sector. Um, well, I, I, I will actually be quite explicit about that a bit later, so, so maybe I'll, I'll come back to that. So you, so you can write down the action in a kind of Lebansky type format in which you can see how to count this um, uh, MHV degree by uh, counting the number of times a parameter appears in the, well, the number of occurrences of some vertex in the, in the Grangian. The, um, well, in perturbation theory, you don't really... Uh, I mean, you see, the point is that the polarization states are complex. And um, uh, so, so if you want to do positive and negative listy, they're, they're necessarily complex. Um, uh, when you talk about a, a, a full nonlinear Lagrangian that's adapted to um, self-duality, then um, it will necessarily be complex, or you will have to work in Euclidean signature uh, uh, if you want things to be real. Okay, so just a couple of transparencies. I think everyone's heard of Feynman diagrams, and you know that Feynman diagrams correspond to com complicated algebraic expressions. Trees are tree diagrams, uh, and the classical loops uh, are quantum. And, um, uh, and, and uh, things get very complicated. And so if you had five gluons, you, 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 you draw actually quite a few diagrams. It's not that many, but... When you work out what they translate into with Feynman diagrams, you get a disgusting mess. And this is one of 20 pages for five particles. So, so it's, uh, um, the standard rules are, are, are very awkward and problematic. Um, gravity is considerably worse. Uh, it was a tour de force by Bryce DeWitt in the 60s to calculate the four particle tree level amplitude. Uh, I don't think. I, I, I don't think he, he even had a go at the five particle one. Um, it's a three big papers. But uh, in the um, uh, uh, 80s, the, um, the full MHV amplitude for Yang, Mill was written, Yang Mills was written down. It has a very simple form, which I won't repeat here. And, and this, this then uh, uh, allowed K, L, and T, Kawhi, uh, uh, well, sorry, this is uh, BGK, Berens, Gila, and Quiff, uh, uh, to deduce the gravity one, uh, a formula for the gravity one, using these so-called KLT relations between gravity and Yang-Mills squared that come out of string theory. So, uh, I mean, I guess they probably just did the first few terms and then spotted a pattern and wrote, it, wrote down a formula that works for all n and checked that it had some reasonable consistency pro properties. Um, this is a reformulation that, that, that David Skinner and I used in, in, in our proof uh, using twisters to calculate the propagation of anti self dual linear fields on a non linear self dual background. So, so we, 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 we managed to compute this just from ordinary field theory. Um, it has also been proved by recursion subsequently as well. Um, so, so it's not too bad. You know, this is a formula that, well, it's, it's sprawled over two lines. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, in this notation, you've got sort of. Um, Spinners of both types from factorizing the momenta, and, and, and we're writing these inner products of the spinners. So the polarization is included in this phase of the spinners, so the spinners themselves are canonical. And uh, we've got a form which is not completely sim sort of symmetric. It ought to be symmetric for gravity, but it's, it's sort of not too unsymmetric as well. We're picking out 1 and n because they're negative velocity, we sum over all perturbations, uh, permutations here. Yeah. So anyway, I, uh, uh, so, so the formula's not too bad, and, and this is for all n. If you imagine the Feynman diagrams would be nightmarish. No, uh, I, I think that they may have even had a variant of this formula. They, they also had this diagrammatic formula, which um, is diagrammatic formalism that the Brown group came up with as well. So the Brown group rediscovered that, yeah. Uh, but I think, they, I, think, I think they did also have a version of this formula as well, uh, um, uh, which, which, which was... Um, so 
we, we, we weren't aware of that, and uh, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I can't remember if it's, a, if it's the same Bern Rosowski paper which has, has their version of this formula. I, yeah. Um, yeah, so they were, they were basically working with KLT as well, I think. Um, okay. No, 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 that's right, that's right. So the other, the other formula, is, uh, and in fact, I could say more about where that formula is coming, coming from in the context of twist reactions in a bit. But, uh, um, okay, so uh, uh, then sort of uh, two years ago, or just under two years ago, Andrew, Andrew Hodges came up with a beautiful way of writing this formula. So the, um, uh, uh, so these angle brackets and square brackets are still these inner, spinner inner products. And so he writes down a matrix, which is the ratio of the square bracket to the angle bracket uh, of, of two of the spinner momenta. Um, and, and I guess that the subtle bit is the diagonal entry. This, this depends on an auxiliary spinner psi, or superficially it does. But because of momentum conservation, we, we actually discover that this matrix phi has co-rank three. You've got three, the A and B are symmetric spinner make indices, and, and so this actually is three three-dimensional kernel, and this is enough to show you that the diagonal entries are actually independent of psi, because the diagonal entries are somehow determined in terms of the other entries by this formula. Um, and then he just writes down, uh, you, you see, in fact, the, 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 the formula I wrote down before uh, should have been fully permutation invariant because of uh, n equals 8 supergravity. In n equals 8 supergravity, you would have a, um, uh, just, just because n equals 8 supergravity exists, uh, uh, that formula sh should have had full permutation symmetry. So I apologize for the lack of symmetry under permutations um, 1 minus n minus because they were negative felicity. But of course, in n equals 8 supergravity, all particles are on the same footing. And, um, uh, uh, and so this formula does that. He, uh, uh, you have the super momentum conservation, which just gives, picks up, uh, picks up um, a trivial factor, this 1n to the 8. And, um, uh, uh, and then we just have a determinant. It, it's, it's really a reduced determinant because thing, this matrix phi has co-rank 3. But you just have a, a, a reduced determinant of this matrix phi tilde. So it turns out that to write it out, you, you sort of break the symmetry, but you prove that this is independent of the choice of ijk. And that's quite an easy thing to do. So... Um, That's right. So, 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 so there you can relate this formula to the Bern Dixon Kosova um, formula by uh, the matrix tree theorem. Uh, and uh, yeah, expand this out to get that formula. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and they, of course, needed this in their loop amplitude calculations. So, anyway, so, 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 so um, uh, uh, I want to sort of um, explain how some of these ideas come out from twister theory. So, I've got to give you a lightning. Tor or Twister theory. So, so, so the, uh, I, I'm going to work all the time with uh, uh, super twisters and super space, uh, uh, super space time. Um, don't worry too much about the super stuff. It will make it allow me to write formally that are much more compact than they would be if I was to write down the corresponding bosonic formally without any supersymmetry. Um, so, uh, uh, so space time has four. Commuting variables, the standard ones that you're familiar with, that can be written out as a uh, product of a spinner and intense product of a spinner and a prime spinner. And um, so these are two component spinners, so two times two is four. And then we have these uh, eight anti commuting variables. And the uh, twister space is, is um, going to be a pair of spinners, lambda and mu. And, um, uh, but defined up to an overall scaling. Fermionically, we have four fermionic variables. And the instance relation uh, with space-time uh, is, is uh, so, so, so a, a point in space-time corresponds to a line in twister space. So, so we have mu is equal to I minus i x lambda, and the corresponding equation for the fermionic variables determines um, just a straight line in this projective space um, from any point in space-time. And uh, a key feature of this is that the um, uh, uh, two points are null separated if and only if the corresponding lines intersect. So uh, if you have two lines in three space, it's a co-dimension one condition that they intersect. And, um, uh, and of course, 
null separation is a co-dimension one condition. So, um, uh, so this is the Klein correspondence goes back to the 19th century, um, but it's uh, um, uh, uh, this is how twister space relates to space time. So it's a completely different space, and space time events are so to speak emergent from uh, uh, twister space by constructing a whole Riemann sphere. So I, I call this a line. Uh, because uh, um, it's a complex projective line, uh, but we think of these lambda a's as being uh, um, homogeneous coordinates on the Riemann sphere. So you, you might have a, um, a, a an affine coordinate zeta is lambda naught over lambda one, and uh, then then it's um, uh, anyway. So, uh, um, uh, so 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 you can reconstruct space time from twister space by looking at these Riemann spheres and. Uh, also the conformal structure by an incidence. And the whole correspondence is actually conformally invariant. Um, uh, and indeed, twister space is, is the fundamental representation of the superconformal group. So it's the, the most elementary um, homogeneous space for the conformal group, the smallest homogeneous space. Okay. Um, Well, it's still a, it's still a line, but it's in the bigger space. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's got some degrees of freedom in in the fermionic directions. That's right. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's lambda as the coordinates on the Riemann sphere, and and then the rest just sort of follows. Um, so 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 what you can imagine. Uh, so what Roger imagines, Roger Penrose imagines back in 1976, really stimulated by Ted Newman was that um, uh, uh, you have this correspondence between twister space and space time. What happens if you deform the complex structure on twister space? And um, uh, the um, answer is that uh, 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 if you deform the complex structure on twister space, it turns out that these um, uh, holomorphic Riemann spheres in twister space still exist. They, they survive the deformation and um, uh, uh, they still exist in a four-parameter family. So it's, it's very surprising. This is actually just an elementary application of the index theorem. It's because it's an elliptic system, you can you can prove just using PDE methods that they still exist, and um, uh, uh, and, and, and you, you find that you get a space time that's four-dimensional. It still has a conformal structure. This method of using instants to determine null geodesics still works, um, and uh, the um, uh, and you discover that the uh, Vial tensor is self-dual as an incompatibility condition for the existence of twisters. And um, uh, uh, so, so, he, he, so, so Roger also uh, further worked out that the, um, uh, so the, 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 the space is actually um, Einstein rather than merely self-dual, uh, conformally self-dual, if um, the twister space admits um, a holomorphic Poisson structure of weight minus two. So, so it has to be a holomorphic Poisson manifold. And the weight is just in this uh, scaling. We rescale Z. Uh, you know, we're looking at the quotient of Z under rescaling. So the, 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 when you do that quotient, this Poisson structure has to have weight minus two. The um, well, I, I don't have too much time to go through all of this. The the the, the um, uh, but but it's just what I was saying that the reconstruct space time is a space of degree one holomorphic curves in twister space. Now, with respect to this uh, uh, deformed complex structure, and uh, the light rays are determined by incidence, uh, Atiyah, Hitchin, and Singer reformulated this in Euclidean signature to make a much easier theorem where, where you can actually represent the twister space as an S2 bundle over space time inside the self dual two forms. And uh, the integrability corresponds to a, a kind of a lax pair. So, 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 so the uh, uh, you can think of the integrability of the al almost complex structure on twister space as um, uh, as a lax pair that follows from the vanishing of the self dual file tensor. The um, twister space can actually ju just be presented as a complex manifold. You can present it in a number of ways using overlap functions, using D-bar operators without any differential constraints on anything. And, um, uh, uh, and, and so... Th it provides a solution in free data for a local self dual manifold. It, this is also expresses the complete integrability of the self duality equations. 
Okay, so how, how can we understand uh, amplitudes in twister space? Um, uh, well, so, so Witten's idea was that because space-time events are um, expressed in terms of holomorphic um, Riemann spheres in twister space, you can think about a, a, a string theory as sort of quantizing uh, what you mean by a holomorphic um, uh, uh, Riemann sphere. You know, just locally, of course, you don't know that it's going to be a Riemann sphere or that it will have degree one. So we reconstructed space-time as, uh, as a degree one holomorphic Riemann spheres in twist, twister space. Locally, it could have any genus and um, uh, uh, it could have any degree. So, um, uh, so, 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 so he, he quantized, just using standard methods of string theory, um, the Riemann spheres, but then uh, uh, the amplitude should be thought of as an integral, a path integral over the space of all holomorphic curves in twister space. And, and the sort of staggering thing that he discovered was that, well, we only wanted degree one to get space-time back, but he found that at degree D, he was getting amplitudes which would have um, MHV degree uh, uh, um, uh, uh, plus, well, so, 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 so the MHV degree is D minus one. So, so at D equals one for lines, you get the MHV amplitude, which is this first perturbation around uh, uh, the self-dual sector. Um, and the higher genus in this uh, should also correspond to the loop order. So, 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 so it was something that was rather boggling, really. We, in twist, twister theory, we were... Uh, so, so, so I started rather a long time ago in twister theory, uh, but twi twi twister theory was stuck for about a quarter of a century on the fact that it could, it could only ever cope with self-dual fields. Um, we had long wanted to sort of quantize uh, uh, the representation of events of space-time as Riemann spheres in twister space, um, but we hadn't realized that you would actually kill two birds with one stone, that, that by quantizing the representation of events as holomorphic curves in twister space, you'd also solve this problem that we could only get the self-dual sector. You, and, and here, uh, what Witten shows is that the level of amplitudes, uh, if you just go up in degree, you're getting the whole expansion around the self-dual sector. And you also have a prospect of getting sort of um, uh, uh, higher loops as well. It turns out the original twister string was problematic for various reasons. It only gave rise to conformal gravity. Nobody ever figured out how to do the higher loop constructions and so on. And uh, a, a route to trying to understand what was coming out of uh, twister string theory was uh, to um, uh, try to reformulate the ideas from twister string theory in terms of a twister action. And this really has two steps, and I'll go into this in more detail in, in a moment. You find an off-shell action for the self-dual sector, and um, uh, uh, it then turns out that you can, you can uh, generate all of the uh, higher degree, MHV degree amplitudes by thinking, but just from the degree one case. And so the MHV generating function turns out to be enough to generate the whole, um, the, the whole of the theory. Uh, and it turns out that, in fact, this led to a very, very simple Feynman diagram calculus, much simpler than anything available on space-time, the so-called MHV formalism. And um, uh, anyway, so, 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 so this, this, is, this has had uh, a substantial impact as well. Uh, now, the twister actions, I mean, I mean I, I, I'm, I'm aiming towards twister actions in this talk, but that, that, that they are perhaps easiest to understand uh, how, uh, in, in the context of twister strings because we do need to solve for the holomorphic curves in twister space. And uh, uh, the, um, so, so twister string theory provides an action for that. So, so, so if you have a world sheet um, sigma, this is a Riemann surface. It a has a, a, a coordinate sigma, which is going to be a complex variable. And, and so the fields then are, uh, on the Riemann surface now are going to be um, a twister that depends on sigma and sigma bar and um, uh, uh, a dual twister um, with values in one forms on the Riemann surface. And um, so, the, uh, um, so, so Z is the map from the Riemann surface to twister space and Y is, is a section of the pullback of the um, 
cotangent run the twister space, and you can write down this uh, Lagrange multiplier action for the condition that z is going to be holomorphic. So you write down y d bar z, you discover that d bar z must vanish, and z is therefore holomorphic, and um, y is um, uh, um, uh, you know, y is a one form, but that ends up having to vanish because there are no one forms on CP1 that are holomorphic. Okay, so um, uh, uh, in this action, uh, uh, in a string action, uh, then you um, add on what are sometimes called vertex operators, and this is just really d what you get by deforming the background. So this VF will have a part, uh, little f, which corresponds to deforming the almost complex structure, and, um, uh, and it'll have, have a part um, G, which will um, uh, uh, be what's in string theory parlance is uh, a B field, but it's a new ingredient that you might not have thought of if you were just thinking about deforming complex structures on manifolds. It's, um, but it's, a, it's not something that you can always add on to a string theory. It's, it's just a, 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 what's essentially a, a two-form pulled back from twister space to the ring and surface. And um, uh, uh, as I say, this um, F has the interpretation of deforming the complex structure of twister space, d bar z equals F, um, and, and, the, um, and it turns out that the, uh, this corresponds to the self-dual part of the field, uh, because this is a via the nonlinear gravity construction. So the nonlinear gravity construction gave us self-dual fields on space-time. Uh, this one form turns out to be dual. It corresponds to an anti-self-dual part of the field, and it's where um, the higher uh, MHV degree comes in, the fact that we're allowed to consider, uh, we, we have a route for putting in uh, uh, minor helicity particles. So it corresponds to anti-self-dual uh, bar Okay. And uh, I, I don't want to sort of go through this in too much detail. I mean, there's a standard rigmarole for writing down amplitude. So, so uh, both Berkowitz and Witten had uh, different versions of string theory, and they both lead to a path integral, which gives rise to an integral over the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of degree d, genus g, n mark points, and then with uh, n of these vertex operators uh, uh, plugged in. And these, of course, depend on the data of n linearized fields. So this is, this is how you write down a, a, a scattering amplitude in string theory. And in general, G would be the loop order, D would be the degree of the map, and it also determines the MHV degree, and N is the number of particles. Yeah, sorry, F is meant to be the sum of them. Yeah, so, so, so F could be either one or the other. And... Um, it turns out that in, this, in the case when you're just dealing with tree amplitudes, this Riemann surface is the Riemann sphere, um, and, and you can, this moduli space is, is something very simple. You can, you can, uh, it's essentially just a, a projective space of, um, that, whose dimension depends on D. It's just, you just write down polynomials, really, and Z is a polynomial in sigma. And, um, uh, and you've got to calculate this correlator, but that's, you've got, that's done by taking contractions of y with z to give uh, Green's functions on the, on the Riemann sphere, which um, where sigma and sigma prime are going to be the um, two points which y and z are, um, are contracted. We actually have arbitrary functions of z in here, so y acts as a derivative operator times this Green's function when y hits a function of z. Um, anyway, so there's a procedure there, and you can calculate, and, and, and we do. Uh, for higher genus, the, um, there are various things which make it hard to understand how it's working. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's not purely formal because the uh, conventional string theory has a very detailed algorithm for computing these things. Uh, some of those ingredients in that algorithm are missing in the original Twister string. Uh, you, you, uh, but it, it's quite technical. You know, there are certain B ghosts that you need and coupling to world sheet gravity. Um, these things are actually improved in, in, in the most recent ambi twister strings. There is a clear prescription in, in the recent ambi twister strings. Uh, uh, it, it, it is. Uh, um, well, it isn't a critical space time dimension. So the condition that it's critical 
uh, tells you what you can couple to, and you get some rather um, you get answers that aren't very satisfying. So the gauge group has to be four-dimensional, which somehow seems a bit odd. It, then it's not critical. Yeah. Well, this is this is only in four space-time dimensions because this is only in twister space. But the um, uh, um, uh, yeah, the criticality is another thing which affects the loop ca calculations, but it does not affect the tree calculations. So, so I mean, it, it means there's maybe some undetermined coefficient at the front of this, but it's just a constant. It doesn't depend on anything interesting. Okay. Now, I'm going to be focusing on how to reduce things to Einstein gravity. Uh, I mean, Roger Penrose actually already addressed this back when he was doing the nonlinear graviton construction, because he started off by saying that you had to have... Um, uh, uh, you know, if you just deform the complex structure arbitrarily, then um, uh, you, you get um, uh, conformal gravity, self-dual conformal gravity. But um, uh, uh, if you preserve a Poisson structure, then you um, get Einstein gravity. It was really Richard Ward actually who filled in that later step uh, and Claude de Brun. But uh, the um, uh, uh, so, so, so um, we need to actually introduce this uh, Poisson structure, and in fact, um, uh, you can you can express it as a Poisson structure or as a contact structure. You can raise the indices or lower the indices because the bosonic indices here are four-dimensional, and uh, uh, so, so so you can think of the Poisson structure as just being i alpha beta d by dz alpha d by dz beta. Uh, you can re-express it as a contact structure as a contact one form if you just multiply by the epsilon tensor to go from one to the other. This um, contains the cosmological constant. I mean, I squared is essentially the uh, cosmological uh, constant. And um, the, um, the, the Poisson structure becomes degenerate when the cosmological constant is zero. And uh, so, so it'll be a feature here that I want to keep lambda not equal to zero for the most part. And uh, we may worry about what happens as lambda goes to zero, but um, uh, yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, uh, and when I said it has weight minus two, of course, th these are d by dz alpha, so each of those has weight minus one. But, but the Poisson structure then has weight two. So, so, so we can then embed Einstein into conformal gravity by asking that the, um, uh, this, this deformation of the almost complex structure F, this is really a, a, a a, a, a holomorphic vector field with values in naught one forms, or naught one form with values in holomorphic vector fields, and we have to ask it to be a Poisson holomorphic vector field. And uh, the dual statement is, is that the one form G, or the one one form G, has to be uh, H tilde times this uh, contact structure. So Well, conformal gravity has a whole sequence, which so 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 for conformal gravity we have an f and a g, but these depend on the four fermionic variables that I wrote down. So if if they don't depend on the four fermionic variables, then it's just the states of minimal, uh, just standard conformal gravity. If you let them depend on all of the fermionic variables, essentially arbit arbitrarily, um, uh, and and you have to make this f be a vector field in the fermionic directions as well as the bosonic directions, and g being a one form in all those directions, then uh, uh, you get all the states. So that means that you get this huge, great, cumbersome theory. So conformal supergravity is a is a big, big, messy theory with a lot of states. Uh, it's, it's not very nice if you uh, write it all out. But uh, I mean, just notationally, this compactifies everything into a statement that you have a vector field and a one form onto the um, uh, 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 on the super twister space. And this is cutting down the degrees of freedom radically. It's, it's essentially from uh, f 4 slash 4 degrees of freedom in the F to, to just 1 in the H. So, uh, uh, but, uh, well, well, sorry, I, I, this is an N equals 4 formulation. So th this naturally extends to N equals 4 supergravity without any extra effort. The, um, yeah, so, so, so we could try to apply the Maldesena argument um, uh, to the berkowitz witten twister string, but the, the berkowitz witten twister string gives rise to a non-minimal version of conformal supergravity, and it gives rise to the incorrect amplitudes. 
Um, I, I just flash this up. This is uh, uh, the, the formula you get with. Uh, um, yeah, maybe I, I'll, I'll fast forward because I'm sort of. So, 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 so this is th th this is actually the formula that, that you get for um, uh, uh, n equals eight supergravity. Um, Expressed as a kind of path integral over Riemann surfaces in, in uh, over Riemann spheres in twister space. Um, so there is a compact formula here, which generalizes the Hodges formula. So so so, so you have these uh, uh, reduced determinants. You have a phi and a phi tilde, which are generated. But I don't want to go on. Uh, what I want to go on to do now is to um, uh, explain. Uh, how these ideas can be fitted into twister actions, because I'm, I'm too short of time to discuss the twister string theory in much detail. So, um, okay, so, so I said that, that, that um, uh, uh, we had this data f and g. Um, so f and g in the string theory were on shell, and that is to say that, that, that these were, that they were not just naught one forms of values in, in the tangent vectors and cotangent vectors, but they were d-bar closed as well. Now, for a twister action, we've got to allow them to be off-shell to start off with. So, 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 um, uh, uh, so, 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 so we just think of them as naught one forms. The, um, now, Berkowitz and Witten worked out in a, a, a sort of a, 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 a twister space action for the self-dual sector that, in some sense, was meant to correspond to the um, degree zero part of the string theory, and um, uh, what that does is, it, 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 is, is, is that it's uh, meant to impose the integrability of the almost complex structure. So this d bar f should square to zero, and um, uh, so, so you can just have a, a Lagrange multiplier action for that. So, so the g is the Lagrange multiplier for the vanishing of the nine house tensor associated with this deformed almost complex structure. So that's very easy to do. And, um, uh, and as I was saying before, um, on shell then, this F corresponds to a self-dual perturbation of the metric, and G corresponds to its, its, its dual, dual. So this, this corresponds to a linearized self-dual Weyl spinner that satisfies the conformal gravity equations, and G uh, is, is dual to that, and it, and it um, uh, corresponds to a linearized anti-self-dual Weyl tensor, psi minus. So, um, we can think of this as coming from, as, as being corresponding to a space-time self-dual action, where psi, which corresponds to, to, to uh, g, is, is, is thought of as a Lagrange multiplier again for the vanishing of the anti-self-dual Weyl tensor. So then, when you vary psi, you discover that the background metric is conformally self-dual. And then when you vary the uh, conformal structure, you find that psi satisfies the linearized Bach equations. Now, in this action, it's very easy to uh, extend it to become the full conformal gravity action. You put in the coupling constant, kappa squared, and this term psi squared. Because what happens is that when you take these two terms together, you integrate out the psi, you discover that um, the Weyl tensor is um, kappa squared times psi, and um, you, you, you end up with, uh, there should be a 1 over kappa squared in front of the, uh, the Weyl tensor squared. And this is the up to a topological term, the action for conformal gravity. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's um, uh, uh, the Plavansky one was for Einstein gravity, and so it was two orders down. So this is, this is a statement about a vowel tensor, whereas the Plavansky one was... Um, uh, so, 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 so I guess the point is this 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 vial minus is 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 maybe well it is projected it's part of the f it's not the whole f uh, so it, it's it's a bit different from Vansky I mean it's not it's not quite the same um, uh, but it's a similar spirit maybe and uh, yeah so 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 the expansion in kappa squared of course then gives the expansion around the self dual sector because the uh, vial minus is equal to kappa squared times psi, and so counting the number of uh, uh, psi's is counting the um, FHV degree, essentially. So, 
Okay, so, so if we can cook up this extra term, the integral of psi squared on twister space, then we can supplement this um, uh, rather simple Lagrange multiplier action by a term that will actually extend the twister action to the full um, uh, conformal gravity equations. Now, the, um, uh, it turns out that in the supersymmetric formalism, there's a very simple formula for that integral psi squared term. So, uh, so, so the integral of, of G gives a, a superfield over a line, and then the integral over the fermionic coordinates contracts up all the indices to give you psi squared. So, so this SMHV just has this expression that um, uh, uh, if we integrate o, 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 over the line X, corresponding to the point little x in space-time, and then integrate over space-time, we, we get this integral psi squared. Now, <coughs> this looks very neat, but of course it's very implicit, because uh, uh, we don't even know what this capital X is yet in twister space, because we, we, we know that it's meant to be the holomorphic curve of degree 1 that is holomorphic with respect to this almost complex structure, d bar sub f. And um, uh, uh, so, so we know that, in fact, when you're doing this integral over x, you're holding this little x constant and integrating over the sigma uh, for some fixed little x when you, when you do this integral, where this z is a solution to this differential equation, this d bar of z is equal to f of z. And so um, the best way to express this uh, is to um, uh, write that down as a constraint. So, so, so we put in a, a y dot d bar z plus f, to, to, to pick out what this line x is. And then we had the integral g all squared to give you the, uh, the, this extra term that we needed. And so uh, in the original conformal gravity twister action then, it was possible to um, uh, uh, take this and reduce it uh, with some gauge fixing to precisely the space-time conformal gravity twister action with full, full off-shell degrees of freedom and everything. So it's... Um, uh, uh, so so, so, so th th this gives a theory that's precisely equivalent um, uh, you know, modulo coordinate freedom to the um, uh, standard conformal gravity. The, um, so we can try and reduce this to the Einstein case. So if we just substitute in f is equal to the Poisson bracket of h, you know, the Poisson, the Hamiltonian vector field of little h, and g is equal to h tilde times tau, we then get a rather nice formula for the self-dual part here. Um, and, uh, uh, well, I, I mean, we get nice formulae for everything. They all, they, everything reduces rather nicely. Um, uh, we have to divide by lambda. So just going back to the beginning, to relate it to the, the conformal gravity action to the Einstein action, we have to divide by this lambda. Uh, and, and that comes out naturally from the self-dual sector, um, it, it's sort of immaterial in this part. Uh, this part doesn't contribute, but, the, uh, but we do have to divide by lambda in this term here. And this is uh, this MHV generating function. Um, so this is still a bit conjectural. Um, so we don't have a direct proof that this is an Einstein action. But, uh, so, so, so this is, th 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 this is uh, what you get by, by reducing to the Einstein degrees of freedom. The... Um, uh, uh, th this will be okay expanding around the self-dual sector, at least to first order. So this will be good to compute the MHV amplitude, for example. Um, it also rather nicely expresses the complete integrability. Uh, so, so we can choose an axial gauge in twister space. So that means maybe you choose just a point in twister space and coordinates so that this H um, has no component in the direction of, of Z bar star. So, so um, we kill off one of the components of H and H tilde as well. And, the, um, uh, and that means that the cubic term H tilde times HH vanishes in the self-dual twister action. Now, this is a gauge that's not accessible from space-time. And uh, uh, it trivializes the self-dual sector. So the self-dual sector becomes free. And so you could say that this um, uh, uh, manifests the complete integrability of the self-dual sector. Yes, so, so, so it's this term which is responsible for the MHV amplitudes. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so, so you can set, so to speak, um, this, this, this second line equal to zero if you're only interested in the self-dual sector. Um, 
but, but, but I guess this term here is only really serving to define the ingredients of this term. It's defining what you mean by integrating over this Riemann sphere here. Uh, uh, the constant value of x. The, um, okay, so in this, in, in this gauge, um, uh, the, the, the theory simplifies considerably. So the kinetic terms uh, are just the h with the h tilde and the y with the z. And we, we need them both. And we just have this vertex uh, uh, y dot f and the integral of g squared. Yeah. Well, it, you see, it's inspired by string theory because you can see there's, in some sense, there's a, there's a string action there defined in the y dot d bar z. But uh, we're, we're making the requirement that z will be um, a Riemann sphere of degree 1 in twister space. And so we're sort of scrubbing out all except that one contribution um, from the string theory. The, um, and then we're hoping to build up the rest of the theory by the rest of the interactions. So uh, using field theory. So, so, so this is a program that, that is completely done and, and makes very good sense for young mills, but, but, but for, for gravity it's, it's, it's still, as I say, got this conjectural aspect. So, so, so the, um, the y d bar z system ha has, has this, uh, this um, Green's function on the Riemann sphere, and then, but you see that we have these functions of z, f and g, and y will act by differentiation on these functions of, on f and g uh, when you do contractions. And um, uh, the integral of g squared, I went to a bracket there, um, uh, th these vertices uh, uh, count the MHV degree. If you have one such vertex, um, your MHV, if you have two of them, you're next to MHV, three of them, uh, n, uh, n, n squared MHV. And... Um, so for the MHV amplitude, we just need to use this sort of uh, integral g squared vertex just once. And, um, and then with that, you see that the, 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 the g has to appear twice. We can't have any d bar inverses because you'd lose one of them. Uh, and we know that that vanishes. So, so we don't use the propagator for h d bar h tilde. We only use the propagators that are in some sense going up and down the, the twister Riemann sphere. And... Um, uh, uh, yeah, you know, so only next to MHV, we'd need to use this op this propagator once. We'd have two of these uh, vertices and just uh, and one of those. Um, to get formally that people can understand, you can put in momentum eigenstates, which uh, uh, have a formula. These these are one forms that can be expressed in terms of the momenta. And um, uh, if we were working with a case when lambda equals zero, uh, the um, uh, propagators um, from the, the, the um, y dot f vertex going to um, h or h tilde but gives this um, kind of Hodges factor rather nicely. Uh, it, well, it gives this, the entries of the Hodges matrix after some trivial conjugation. And um, so we can see the Hodges matrix actually arising as um, what happens when you, when you have um, uh, Feynman diagrams that involve lots of these um, uh, uh, y dot f vertices. Okay. Anyway, so um, we can extend these ideas to lambda not equal to zero by using different wave functions. We can, we can use wave functions which are essentially Fourier transform wave functions on twister space. And the... Um, uh, uh, um, so this ij factor, which was a spinner in a product in, in the Hodges lambda equals zero formula, can be replaced by this um, uh, infinity twister times wi wj in the... Um, uh, uh, but to write down a Hodges-type matrix. So uh, anyway, we can go through the calculation, and uh, uh, th there's a special trick here that you can, you can sum together all the... Um, uh, uh, Feynman tree graphs using the matrix tree theorem. And it turns out that this um, matrix that we're writing down with the square bracket ij's over angle bracket ij's turns out to be um, uh, uh, crucial in this. And um, yeah, so the Feynman tree theorem gives you a determinant of a matrix which is made out of all of the edge contributions to the propagators in the graphs. So, so we get these... Um, 
Uh, in fact, we get a slightly sort of complicated expression. Um, we get a 1 over lambda at the front because that was what we needed to get, go from conformal gravity to Einstein gravity. Uh, we get a, a, a co-rank 2 determinant instead of co-rank 3 in the original Hodges formula. And then we get an extra term as well. The, um, uh, uh, but, but you can check this as lambda goes to zero. You can see, see that, that this is effectively some sort of differentiation as lambda goes to zero. And this turns into a co-rank 3 uh, matrix as in Hodge's formula. Okay. So, um, so, so, so we have um, some sort of good control over tree-level gravity uh, uh, S matrix and twister space, but mostly via twister strings. So the, the approach via the twister action is still, to a certain extent, conjectural. Um, uh, uh, so, 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 so the twister strings, of course, are always going to be essentially perturbative. You're always going to just be generating uh, um, uh, amplitudes via string path integrals. Uh, but the... Um, uh, twister action, one would hope, would be non-perturbative. It would be easier to think about background field calculations. I mean, you might be able to be, think about background field calculations in a twister string theory, but probably only on a holomorphic background, which would be self-dual. And, um, okay, I mean, there's plenty of further questions. I mean, the, the biggest problem I have, the reason why these things are conjectural is because the reduction from full gravity to Einstein gravity implicitly brings in a background, and, and so it's not a proper geometric framework. There are other formulae for N equals 8 supergravity, which are fascinating. Uh, Cachazo and Guy have one, uh, uh, which is also twistorial. Uh, so there, there, there's, there, there's, and that relates to this BCJ gravity equals Yang mill squared story. So that's, that, that's, that's something that needs to be understood. And there's, um, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, so there's lots of things to do. Um, uh, uh, I still... Yeah, I'd like to say that uh, you know we're, we're now up and running to do quantum gravity in twister space, but uh, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, they're, they're still technical. I, I don't think I, I don't think there's really something that works very cleanly at loops yet. Um, but, but maybe maybe soon. Now it's been moving on quite rapidly recently. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, so th that's right. So, so that's that's why uh, they're, they're, they're tree level. The, I mean, as I was saying, the ambi twister string seems to make sense at one loop. Uh, it seems to make like, sense at high, high, uh, arbitrary loop orders. The uh, it's because it's because because of its it's, it's non geometric nature. It has a um, builds in a background. Uh, and, and so that's, uh, I, I mean, so, so, so I, I need a better way of expressing it, really, that, 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 that's more geometric. Yes, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess you'd get to a, um, uh, well, what's nice in the Yang-Mills case and in the conformal gravity case is, is, is you make a gauge choice and it just collapses onto the space-time, full nonlinear space-time action. So that's the proof I'm looking for. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, and it just hasn't happened yet. Uh, and, and it's because, I mean, it's a bit of sleight of hand. It probably didn't look too bad as I did it, but there was a back, there's a flat background there. And, um, uh, well, I mean, they're, they're, they're very similar. Uh, the, the, I mean, I mean see, that, well, there's a lot of differences in detail. So, so Skinner's n equals 8 twister string, uh, has n equals two world sheet supersymmetry. It has um, so 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 you've got the y and the z that I told you about, but it, it also has some some spinners on the world sheet, a row and a row tilde. And um, uh, and it's really the world sheet spinners that are responsible for producing correctly all of those determinants in the Cachazo Skinner formulae. Uh, 
Yeah, and it's worse than that because we, we were trying to compare the two approaches and it falls over if you put... So, so, so the way that he expressed it in the original paper made it look like it worked for all lambda. But then you try and work it out and it just fails to become well, uh, it's, it fails to be well defined for reasons that are sort of... Um, uh, we still don't understand. Well, I mean, I mean, so the twist reactions are meant to be doing that. I mean, that's uh, uh, so, so in the formal gravity, um, uh, that, that that's easy. Um, but 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 there is something that's slightly unpleasant about it, which is which is that the um, if, for example, you wanted to do, uh, do quantum gravity on a curved black hole, then you would be perturbing around uh, a complex structure that was not integrable. So an almost complex structure that was not integral integrable. And, and, and then you'd lose a lot of um, nice uh, uh, facts. Um, so, yeah, in some sense, uh, uh, the... Yeah, so perturbations around the self to your sector are nice. Um, I mean, the other thing that one could do is maybe think about it from uh, a, a scry viewpoint. You know, so then at scry, you don't mind um, working on the H spaces at scry. So they are the self dual sectors. So there may be a way of thinking about it like that, which would, I think would be more attractive. You know, if, if you are focusing on the S matrix and working from scry minus to scry plus makes good sense, and you have canonical integrable complex structures on the twisted spaces at scry. So I, I think that's probably the most civilized way to probably proceed on the background. Um, but, you know, so, so the asymptotic twister space for uh, any stationary space time is flat. So, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, so, 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 so you wouldn't necessarily know that you're working on Kerr, except maybe for some global, global reason. Yeah. So, so, so the twister strings um, are now, in some sense, generalized to uh, what we've kind of, in an effort at branding, um, uh, called ambi twister strings. And uh, amb ambi twister strings are um, uh, best understood, I guess, as um, infinite tension limit of the standard string in ten dimensions. And uh, so there's a series of remarkable formulae that. Um, uh, I mean, this is a whole parallel development that came up last year from Kishaz, Freddy Kashazo and his group, Song He and Alice Yuan. And, and um, so they exist in arbitrary dimensions, these formally. And these are formally for Yang Mills and gravity amplitudes, tree level amplitudes, again, based on a Riemann sphere and the so called scattering equations. And um, uh, so, so Dave Skinner and I. Uh, have understood that those managed to show that those formally arise from uh, a string theory in, in what we call ambi twister space, which is the space of complexified null geodesics in space time. So, so you take a space time, you complexify it a bit, you look at all the complex null geodesics, even those that are going out in the x plus i y direction, and uh, uh, the um, uh, and that gives you uh, a string theory that's. Um, uh, critical in ten dimensions, and it gives you the um, essentially the standard sort of type two string in ten dimensions, uh, and it gives you the correct aptitudes for the NSNS sector on the nose. Um, and and I think I think they've so this is the string theory that uh, this is the, it, so, so this is the kind of the twister string analog that does seem to extend well to loop orders. These Cachetto type formally work well uh, in three dimensions and other dimensions and uh, they, they have variants in lots of dimensions but I think they all come out of variants of this ambi twister string and, and, and uh, so, so, so it just seems to be a general pattern so, so it's quite nice that, 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 that this, uh, you get string theory without the infinite tower of modes but the price you pay of course is, is that the um, uh, loop amplitudes will all be divergent so um, 
so, so, so you don't have the infinite tower of modes, but you have all the divergences you expect of 10-dimensional supergravities. Uh, I mean, there's a sweet spot if you reduce it to six dimensions where I think it's not very divergent, <laughs> uh, uh, either infrared or ultraviolet for the first few orders. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, anyway, but if you're just interested in these tree-level formulae, then, that, then they, they, they work in all dimensions. But. Yeah, the Swiss fractions don't yet work in any other dimension than four. Uh, 